So, hello everybody, um, and thanks for joining uh, the first workshop session um, on air conditioning and ventilation, so CFD for air conditioning and ventilation. And um, my name is David, I'm going to talk about um, who I am in a second in more detail, but let's first um, get some technical things out of the way. So we're using this GoToWebinar application to stream this webinar today. Um, and it has it has this neat um, raise your hand uh, functionality. Um, and could you quickly indicate to me that um, the sound is working properly for you by raising your hand? I see some hands, not all of them. Ah, there you go. Great, <laughs> excellent. Okay. Um, Great, so if there's anything um, technical coming up during the webinar, there's problems with my sound, with my microphone or something, um, just use this raise your hand um, functionality and let me know about it. Um, so most of the attendees can hear me. I see a ton of hands uh, today for the ones that can't hear me yet. It's probably something with your, um, with your audio setup on your end. Okay. Um, then some other hints uh, before we dive into the content of this topic. Um, we do record this session, uh, and thanks for raising the hands so you can put them down again. <laughs> thanks a lot, though. Um, so we do record this session. Uh, the recording is running um, while I speak, and um, we will put we will publish this recording afterwards on YouTube, and um, all of you will receive an email to the to the recording, so um, there's no need that you now, um, I don't know, start simulating um, in parallel or take a ton of notes or something. Um, just uh, just wait for the email, and once the, the recording has been processed, which is hopefully today, um, the latest by tomorrow, um, you're going you're gonna to have a recording of it, and you can, f can follow it in, in more detail on your own speed. The last note is... Um, we have a very, very packed schedule for today, so I want to I wanna start as soon as possible. Um, and the, if there's, but at the end, I'll try to sneak in some, some question and answers. So um, the last minute, we're going to have a, a little Q&A, um, and you can type in your questions at any point in time during the webinar. So whenever there's a question popping up, um, just put it into this question um, field at, at GoToWebinar, and I'll try to cover them afterwards. Um, as I said, we probably won't have so much time because we have a very packed schedule, but I'll try to cover some of them and the ones that have not been answered yet. Um, there's a forum and there's a ton of other opportunities or possibilities to get them answered um, by us. But without further ado, let's um, get this workshop started um, and we'll dive into it. So my name is David. Um, I'm the Managing Director here at SimScale. Um, I'm a CFD engineer by background. Uh, and specifically, I did a, a lot in multi-phase flow modeling, um, a, a research and application, and also turbulence modeling, and some rather exotic GPU acceleration of finite volume codes. Uh, but today, we're going to mainly talk about buoyancy-driven flows, right? Natural convection flows, and we're going to hear about that um, more in a second. You can find me. I'm very active in the forum. Um, I'm very active in the in the SimScale community. So. The, you should have my email address via this um, GoToWebinar where you can address uh, questions also directly to me or reach out to me in the forum, and I'm going to show the forum in a second later. All right, um, a quick look at the agenda for today. Um, first, we're going to talk about, in general, about a CFD and SimScale. I'll try to keep this as crisp as possible. I promise I try to um, get as hands-on as possible today, but there are some things I want to mention before to, to sort of give the big picture uh, why we're here, um, why we're doing the things we're doing them. Um, in, in a way we're doing them. Um, afterwards, we're going to look at specifically today, we're going to talk about um, CFD for data center cooling. Um, we actually will simulate together a hands-on demo, so we will do a live demo um, where we're going to look at a very simplified data center application because in general, this whole workshop series is about air conditioning and ventilation, right? And so we're going to see similar concepts in each of the sessions, in each of the homework assignments. So it's really this first session is not at, you know, um, in-depth data center modeling, uh, performance characteristics of, um, of cooling units, of, of data centers. It's really just to get a little bit of a feeling of how SimScale works and to, to gain your first um, hands-on experience with SimScale. So there won't be too much physics today. There won't be too much 
you know, detailed CFD um, talking today. It's really t um, today about getting um, a first overview and how SimScale works. The homework assignment um, will be the last part where we're going to talk um, where you will have the chance with a step-by-step -step tutorial that we provided. We just we just launched it an hour ago, um, so it's, it's brand new, and you're going to have the chance to apply what you learned, what you've seen today, um, hands-on yourself. Um, so the idea of these workshops is not just, you know, not just another webinar um, that shows some application, but since SimScale completely runs cloud-based, you're going to have the chance um, to, to get your hands dirty, dirty yourself. Okay. Um, the next uh, step, let's quickly, um, let's quickly cover who we are, what we're doing. So SimScale, we're, I'm, I'm speaking to you right out of our office based in Munich, Germany. Um, so we are, our headquarters is in Munich. We're around um, 40 people here from 18 different uh, nationalities, meanwhile, so um, qu quite, a, quite a team, meanwhile. Um, originally, we founded SimScale as an engineering simulation consultancy, so we've been a consulting company providing simulation services um, um, in the Dach region um, to, uh, to industrial companies here, mainly in CFD as well as structural analysis. And we, at some point, started the development of um, a completely web-based end-to-end um, -end workflow for engineering simulation, which was in 2011. And now, five years later, um, we're dedicated um, to, um, to maintain and to develop this, this cloud-based simulation platform that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, we're going to mainly talk about um, ventilation and air conditioning today. So we, we oftentimes refer to this as HVAC, so heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Um, which has several aspects, and this is one of the main industry verticals where SimScale is being used. But since, and you're going to see that later, since it's a general purpose simulation tool, um, we've got customers in in um, in various uh, different industry verticals where SimScale is being successfully applied as a simulation tool. Um, but more on that later. Yeah, and that's um, a bunch of people here, the, the SimScale team. Um, so. Um, why CFD at all? So the, the question is, I mean, some of you might already uh, been uh, or, or might already have quite ex quite some experience with CFD or maybe CFD engineers yourselves. Some of you might not yet um, have done so much with CFD or, or have not been in touch with flow simulation so far. So computational fluid dynamics, why at all? Um, why should you care about it at all? And um, the, the in, in one minute or in one slide, we we see it that way. So the, the traditional design process without using simulation methods, without using CFD at all, starts with a lengthy initial design phase. Um, and once you feel comfortable with the design, so you have you have designed your product, in that case, that's a butterfly valve, but uh, you can apply it um, essentially in a similar manner to a data center layout, right? Um, or to any other HVAC system you might be dealing with, or a ventilation system you might be dealing with, uh, a ventilation layout, for example. Um, so, you, so in your initial design phase, you're sketching the layout, and once you feel comfortable, um, you might be ready to do some physical prototyping, to do some real-world testing, to see actually if your design performs um, performs how you uh, how you expect it to perform. And this takes time. This costs money. Um, and after a lengthy time, you're going to have the information you need to, to optimize your design, right? To, to make design changes accordingly, um, to use the information, go back and, and make it, uh, changes uh, to, your, to whatever you design, to whatever um, you, you're in the process of developing. And once you're done um, in, the, in, the, rather in the mechanical engineering world, you would manufacture it. In another one, you would um, go into the next phase of your, of your project. So this is really a, a generic way of um, putting simulation into perspective. And what CFD allows you to do is essentially um, you're going to reduce this, these costly, time-consuming design cycles with physical testing, real-world testing, to something that, is, um, that happens completely virtually. Um, so you can basically pre-pwn. You can start earlier with a, with a rougher design, just something you, know, you quickly sketched, and immediately get a feedback um, on how your design will perform in the real world. So how um, will design changes affect the performance of whatever I'm designing. In that case, again, we have things, this valve as an example. Here, you would care about typical performance factors of a valve would be the pressure drop across the valve, right? Um, the cavity risks, at a cavitation risk, um, uh, 
um, the characteristics while the valve is opening and closing, etc. And all of this, you could ultimately, with testing, with physical testing, you would have these informations very late. With virtual prototyping, so simulation, you can have these, these, this information much early in the design process, which essentially allows you to design faster, be better, and more cost-efficient. Right? This is what, what all of this comes down. Um, and essentially, the, it's, it's, um, this can be applied to a layer of a data center cooling um, at the same uh, of, a, of a cooling system for a data center um, very similarly. Right? You're going to wonder how many cooling units you will need. You're going to wonder um, where you would place them. Will it, um, perf will it cool the data center? Um, sufficiently will uh, is the risk of equipment failure low enough etc right these are the the performance characteristics of your cooling unit in in the data center and it's this that's essentially true in many many um, hardware development processes and by using simulation, by designing better, faster, and more cost-efficient, it ultimately comes down to um, to giving you a competitive advantage, right? So ultimately, it comes down to 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 money in your pocket, to being um, to being uh, faster than your competitor to market, to ship a better product than your competitor, and um, to having it developed more cost-efficiently on on your end, um, which gives you this edge. So this is sort of a the, the one minute super brief overview over why you should care about simulation and CFDs of flow simulation in specific. Okay, um, now there's a ton of um, flow simulation applications out there. So there's a ton of software vendors providing CFD solutions you could be using. So um, now, now why is there another one? Why, why SimScale? Um, and to, again, very crisp here. We do, we do think that the traditional way of um, how CFD, um, how the CFD market serves their customers, how CFD applications, traditional on-premise CFD applications are being delivered today has three main advantages and uh, disadvantages. And this is what we are trying to change with SimScale. So there are three fundamental differences between SimScale and, um, and many other um, software applications in the flow simulation space. And the first one is um, accessibility. With SimScale, and you're going to see it in a second, it runs completely web-based. So there is no need to install and roll out any hardware on your end, you know, um, any high-performance computing hardware, large clusters or, or whatnot, you need to, to run um, a traditional on-premise flow simulation solutions. So no hardware, and then everything runs web-based. So there is no need to install any software on your end to, to update any software on that end. So all of this hassle is being taken away while priding you with um, with practically unlimited computing power. So SimScale runs on the cloud. So this means no heavy lifting is being done on your machine. Whenever you have a project where you're going to run a ton of simulation cycles, a ton of simulations for one project, you just spin up more machines using SimScale. And once your project is over, you spin them down again. So it's really, um, it's, it, it removes the burden of deploying hardware and software on your end. The next one is cost efficiency. Um, we built SimScale um, embracing the fact that simulation is by, by, by its very definition something very volatile, right? You, you, you might need simulation a lot in, a, in one project and you might need it not that much um, one project later. And so this is, um, and, and we want SimScale to be, to, to scale up and down with the demands you're having, right? So we want SimScale to be, um, you, you can start tipping your toe into it for a very, for a very low financial commitment and once you need more simulation once you need to scale it up um, you can simply um, you know spin up more machines and it's a it's a it's an on-demand pricing model it's sort of what we believe in the it's the cost efficiency aspect of SimScale and the third one is um, with a traditional we see traditional um, CFD tools being developed for experts to use because all of this hardware and software burden so this technical burden you need to take on for traditional tools as well as the the very high fixed costs you need to accept for the traditional tools this leads to the fact that typically um, tr traditional CFD solutions are only deployed um, to somebody that is using it all day long right otherwise it would be economically not um, not feasible and so um, even if you take on um, the, the hardware and software burden, if you, even if you are ready to commit um, the, the high financial expenses um, that's necessary for traditional CFD solution, um, they then, it, it'll, 
it'll bring software that is very hard to use, that has been developed for decades for experts to use. And this in turn um, makes new users to CFD, um, it, it gives them a hard time to, to apply CFD effectively in their design projects. So we want to build SimScale um, in a way that it's, that it's for everyone. So I'm going to show you in a second what we mean with this. So we, we have a ton of crowdsourced know-how in the SimScale community. So there's a very active forum. There's a lot of public projects that can be used by everybody as templates and um, we're hosting these workshops in a very open manner that everybody can participate in and can basically join this platform without even for free right there is a free tier for public use and meanwhile we collected over 15,000 public project templates that you can use so we're trying to give everybody a much lower um, barrier know-how barrier to jump over to 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 being successful with CFD and, and, and simulation in general all right um, a quick look at what's possible with SimScale before we dive into the actual application we, we, we want to simulate today. Um, the, so SimScale in general has been built as a general purpose engineering simulation environment. So it does not only provide CFD solutions uh, or CFD capabilities, so flow simulation capabilities, but it also ships structural mechanics analysis, um, thermal analysis capabilities, acoustics analysis, as well as particle phenomena. Um, and all of this is being delivered via the same user interface on the same platform, um, basically functioning very similar. And in specific for flow simulation, um, the current status quo is um, that we ship both incompressible and compressible um, flows, um, buoyancy driven flow. So this is what we're going to uh, look at today. So it's a compressible flow that is weakly compressible. Um, so we're going we're gonna to hear later what this exactly means. And um, you can model steady state and transient um, flows, um, both single as multi-phase multi flows, which means um, a free surface flow. I'm just checking on the pictures here on the right. Yeah, here. This would be a, a tank swapping, right? So you have a... Um, you have a free surface, so both the water in this tank um, as well as the, the air in that tank is being solved, is being simulated, and you, you, you can treat free surfaces. So that would be multi-phase as opposed to single phase, which we're going to look at today. There are, some, there are different turbulence models involved as well as mass transport can be, um, can be analyzed. Um, conjugate heat transfer um, models are available as well where you essentially solve for um, the heat transfer within solid being in touch with fluid domains, for example, in heat exchanger applications um, or electronics um, cooling app um, uh, applications. There's a, a ton of other advanced applications um, that are, can be modeled in SimScale. If you're specifically interested in something, um, I can highly recommend that you, um, if you have not done so yet, that you jump on our um, free plan um, and explore it yourselves. I think um, engineers, uh, we as engineers all, always want to, you know, get a feel for, for how, how this works and try it, try it out ourselves. And we've built SimScale having this in mind. All right, um, before we now dive into the application um, today, let's check on if there are any urgent questions popping up so far or any technical issues. But um, seems fine like that. So um, there have been some questions in the meantime. Um, uh, so... Um, Uh, but I'll answer them later. So um, I'll, I promise I'll try to cover them in the, in the question and answer section. Um, but there are no urgent technical issues. So let's just move on at that point. Okay, today we're going to look specifically on how to apply SimScale, how to use SimScale um, and specifically CFD and SimScale to design data centers um, better, faster, cheaper, right? In general, what we're going to see today is generally applies to all sorts of cooling applications. So we're going to use later a very, very simplified data center geometry because today it's not about, you know, this is not a case study that we're showing or, or how to deal with complex data center designs, etc. It's really just to see an end-to-end -end workflow through SimScale, how a cooling process can be simulated with SimScale. And so we're going to use a very um, simplified geometry later. But why, why do you care about flow simulation for data center design? And essentially, right, it comes down to that ultimately um, 
in the layout phase, in the design phase of your data center, you want to make sure that you, on the one hand side, provide sufficient cooling power to um, keep the temperature low enough in every um, section, in every part of your data center, um, to prevent equipment failure at, at, at these points, right? You want to you wanna avoid having hotspots somewhere um, that may, might lead to the fact that your racks are overheating and that, you've, that you end up with equipment failure in the field. Um, next, um, uh, I found this reference that that the cooling equipment in a data center accounts for um, roughly 40% of the energy consumption, right? So if you can leave out one cooling unit, this or, or, or if you can if you can save on cooling unit while making sure that you're having sufficient cooling um, cooling power in the field in your data center. Um, you can provide significantly lower operation costs, right? So you can ultimately um, ship a data center design that is um, that it gives you a competitive edge, that that is a better design that that um, than a competitor might have. And then, last but not least, obviously, already ensuring that you meet industry regulation and standards already during the design phase. So all of this comes again down to this fact of um, as a as engineers, we're always facing the challenge of designing faster, better, and more cost-efficient, right? And this is basically how faster, better, and more cost-efficient is being translated to, to data center design. Um, and so today, what we're going to specifically look at is um, that CFD ultimately provides you or, or gives you the chance to check on performance insights, to check on how your data, design, uh, data center design performs much earlier in the design process. So you, you can... Um, make crucial design decisions much earlier. By that, you can save time, you can explore more design uh, scenarios, and ultimately ship faster, better solution. So we're going to look later at, um, at w sort of weather maps of showing uh, velocity distribution and temperature distribution in the room, um, given a specific cooling um, that you want to analyze. Um, we're going to see how hotspots can be identified. You can um, check on several different design options to gain more confidence in the design you're supplying. Um, also, once a cooling equipment might fail in the field, right, might, might fail in the field, um, you can assess that very quickly how, um, how severe it is, as well as quickly test um, fast uh, a lot of what-if scenarios. So let's get our hands dirty. Today we're going to look at, as I said, as a very simplified server room. So we're going to look at a very, very um, uh, simple geometry where we have um, a, a room where some racks placed in there um, and we have a cooling supply here. And so we're going to supply the room with cool air here. This is our outlet where the cool air, uh, where the air is being um, uh, leaves the room, and obviously the racks um, uh, supply hot air to the room, and we, we're going to look at how, um, what type of temperature distribution appears in that room or, or, or is being generated in that room, and how can that be optimized. Um, now again, this is a very simplified geometry. It's about checking on how SimScale works and not a case study, right? But essentially, the type of workflow we're going to see today, as well as the, the analysis setup, the post-processing, et cetera, will apply to um, any other geometry you might be interested in, right? So, yeah, that's that's basically, this is why we're always in these workshops dealing rather with simple geometries. Okay, what we're going to see is um, we're going to do a live demo uh, to, to see how SimScale works, to get a feeling for, for how this looks and feels. And what we're going to do is we're first going to upload our um, a CAD model of the server room to SimScale. We're going to then uh, generate a computational mesh um, on SimScale. So to, we, we essentially uh, discretize the domain for being able to simulate the, um, the airflow um, through this domain. Then we're going to set up the whole simulation. So we're going to define what type of temperature is down here, what type of temperature here. So we're going to basically set the constraints of the simulation. And ultimately, we're going to do a little bit of post-processing to actually check on, OK, how did this, um, how, what's the resulting temperature in the, in the field? What's the resulting velocity distribution within our data center? Um, to, to get a feeling for how the design can be optimized. That's sort of, that's sort of the idea, right? Ultimately, to make a design decision to see where are, um, where are zones of, um, of, very, uh, of slow moving air that might heat up, um, et cetera. So to, to basically gain information to make design decisions earlier and to, 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 to uh, create a better design. That's, that's the whole idea. And why we're using this slide so often is really that 
this the essential workflow so that you bring up a CAD model that you generate a, um, a mesh on SimScale and set up the actual physics so the the actual simulation and run it on SimScale is very very similar um, in a lot of different analysis types so um, next next week for example in the second session of this workshop right we're gonna look at um, we're gonna look at contamination control in parking lots so how um, Ventilation uh, systems, so fan placement, can be done um, or can be optimized with using SimScale to make sure that a contamination within a parking lot is being on, is, is under control and and um, and scenarios can be analyzed. And, and we're going to use a very very similar setup. And next next time we will not spend so much time on this on this how to, but we're going to start immediately with the um, with the with the case because the setup is always very very similar on SimScale. What we're also going to do today is that we're going to not spend too much time on CAD model preparation and how did we set up this CAD model of the server room, etc. And we're going to show you quickly how an import from Onshape works. Onshape is one of our um, CAD partners and we're going to import the server room from Onshape and then analyze it in SimScale. Okay, um, so much for, for um, the introduction basically and now let's start. Um, Let's look at if there is some urgent question in the meantime. Um, there are a lot of questions already. Um, bear, uh, bear with me for a second. I really want to, we're, we're low on time uh, today anyways. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to um, walk through the entire uh, process and make sure that I'll answer some Q&As at the, at the end, right? All right, so SimScale entirely runs in your web browser, right? So the only thing I do is I go to simscale.com I type, I type in my, um, oh, that's great, I'll type in my um, my login credentials, I'll log in, and that's all I need to do to essentially um, basically use SimScale, right? And on simscale.com you can see in the top right that there is a, if you do not have an account yet, there's um, the option to create a free account. Um, takes you one minute to set up, maybe two, um, and you're in there, and you have, as I do right now, an, an account. On SimScale, the rough layout is whenever you enter, the first thing you're going to see is the dashboard, right? Here I do have the latest projects I'm working on, um, what I have done in the forum, latest uh, simulation jobs I ran. Um, so that's basically the, the starting point to, to get active in SimScale. If I switch over to public projects, I can see all of these, what I said before, 15,000 projects, many thousands are added each week. So this is the entire SimScale community, a ton of engineers generating public projects that I can use um, as, as templates for myself, right? So I can just hop in here and if I'm, maybe you're not in, into data center calling, but maybe some other HVAC application. So you can just go in here and look for um, what, if there's a similar application that has been already simulated with SimScale, you make a copy of it, and, and use it for your own purpose. Yeah? So that's the that's the public projects. The next one is the forum. Let's hop over to the forum over here. So the forum is um, basically the place to, to discuss and get help from engineers um, or from fellow engineers that are also using SimScale. All our, the whole SimScale team is very active in the forum. So there's a ton of, um, a ton of engineers here that, that provide support via the forum. Um, and whenever you have a question, that that's the first place you should be going to. And also later, you're going to see it here already. Session one, air conditioning. This is the the homework, um, the homework assignment. We're going to take a look at this later. Then there's a ton of um, so there's the documentation, there's a uh, um, there's tutorials, etc. Under the help tab, some some learning videos, tutorials, etc. That that help you getting started as well. Okay, um, so much for um, getting a little bit of an overview. And now what we're going to do is we start from the beginning to set up a new project. So this is the this is the button you want to start your new project with. So you go to your dashboard, you create hit the create new project, and we're going to do data sender CD webinar um, webinar project. Um, and there is a description, and the description is quite helpful for um, if you if you search later in your projects to give it some keywords, you know, um, I don't know, uh, data center, CFD, um, turbulent. Some here you can put in some 
um, some keywords that help you later to find projects because I have a lot of uh, I have hundreds of them so this this is helpful. Um, then, as I said, there is a as a um, as a community user, so as a free user on SimSkill, you do not have the option to create private projects. As a paying customer on SimSkill, you can't create private projects, um, and this is basically this button, right? So this is the great thing with the with the free community plan. You can just start yourself without any commitment and without any you know contract signed or, or, or without any um, overhead, just jump in there and create an account and, um, and, and start, start working on SimSkill. Um, I'm going to keep that private for the moment and um, again, the, the category is helpful for later finding your projects. Um, okay, I can now already drag and drop my CAD files here to have them e immediately up uploaded to the new project, but in this case, I want to import one from Onshape, right? And so what I'm going to do is I created this new one. This is now the new project, um, and there's an overview page. So if you click on it, there's an overview page that gives the rough information, right? If I would have some contacts in here, um, contents in here, you would see them already. Um, and to ultimately open it in the workbench, you're going to click on Open this project. And now I'm seeing the fully fledged simulation environment, right, in which I can set up um, my project. The simulation environment is distributed or, or is organized in three main tabs. The first one is the mesh creator here, which essentially um, allows you to upload CAD models and to gener generate computational grids for it, so to do all your meshing works, CAD preparation works, up, up, upload, import, etc. The, th the second one is the simulation designer. Here it's all about physics, so here you set up boundary conditions, initial conditions, what type of analysis you want to run. And um, the post-processor. Post-processor is all about once your analysis has been solved, so once your simulation ran, you want to go to the post-processor for analyzing the results, visualizing it, etc. Okay, um, so let's get started. I can upload geometries, obviously, from my, from my desktop, but in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to import one from Onshape. And Onshape is uh, one of our CAD partners um, that provides a fully-fledged um, uh, 3D parametric CAD um, environment, completely cloud-based, and we have a direct connector with them. And so what I can do is, um, I'm, this is basically, these are all my Onshape projects that I have over in Onshape. Um, again, let's, let me quickly show that to you. Onshape has a very similar pricing model, so you can create your free account over here as well. It comes completely for free. Um, parametric CAD, so here you can, can get a little bit of an, of an idea of what's, what's possible in Onshape. Okay, and so you can see already that I have here my data center CAD model, um, and so I'm, I'm choosing this CAD model and say, okay, I want to import this one now. And you can see it already that what we're going to do later is we're going to do a very, very small design study. So we're going to compare two different data center designs where I've chosen a different, um, a different sort of fan placement for the cooling unit that we, we're going to see that later. But for the time being, we're going to stick to one uh, data center uh, de uh, design, and so you can see it. It's very, very basic, very simple, right? We have the six racks here. We have the the cooling uh, unit inlet down here, and we have the um, the air will leave um, through this guy here, through this phase. Okay, first step as discussed is we're gonna generate a mesh, and also we we offer other workshops where we deep dive into meshing, we offer a professional training where there's a whole session only on meshing, what you can do with SimScale when it comes to the finite volume method, what you should be looking for, etc. But in 60 minutes, we just want to give you, um, we, we just uh, want to give you a, a brief overview of, of how this works. So we're not going to spend a ton of time in meshing, we're also not will spend a ton of time in um, in discussing the, the details of the analysis. Okay, and as you just saw, let me quickly go back. So I simply said mesh geometry and it created a new mesh from geometries and meshes. So it's called automatically data center one room mesh and it generated automatically a first mesh operation. One quick hint here on SimScale, we've built SimScale with having um, touch interfaces in mind, with having a very simple to use user interface in mind. So Yes, there is a ton of context menus, so you can always go um, and say and make a right click on a lot of stuff and, and use context menus. But everything which works via a, left, via a right click, so mesh geometry or create new mesh, always works via a left click as well, right? So we're trying to make the, the workflow very, very streamlined. 
Okay, so essentially this new mesh, um, now the, the mesh operations, which is called automation, uh, operation one, essentially defines how the mesh should be generated. There are different meshing algorithms on SimScale, um, and the one we want to use today is the hex dominant automatic for internal flow. This essentially, this CAD model describes already the flow domain, right? You can see that this is not this is not the positive, this is the negative of, um, so I basically model the flow domain in Onshape. Um, if I would have not this, um, if I would have done the positive of the CAD model, I could use other meshing algorithms. And this is a, is a different topic when it comes to CAD preparation, but essentially there's, a diff, there's different meshing algorithms, um, some for structural mechanics, some for CFD, um, and all of them work the same way. Okay, so what we're going to do is, and you can see it already, there's not a lot of options here. Um, the first one um, is how, how fine do we want this mesh to be generated? Um, and we want it coarse, let's start just that way. Second one is how many cores, again, we're cloud-based, we're having unlimited computing power, um, and the standard plans come with up to 32 core machines, and you can just choose what you're up to. In this case, since we're only running a coarse mesh, mesh four cores should be fine. And then the last one, surfaces with layers. Um, so essentially, and we will not cover this topic in, in, in much detail today, but we're going to run later a turbulent flow simulation. And um, in, in, in turbulent flow, um, you're having, you're having the, the, the flow attached to the wall being at velocity zero, and then what, what will happen there is a boundary a layer will be um, a turbulent boundary layer will appear close to physical walls. And what you want to have is um, you want to resolve these boundary layer regions. So all walls, everywhere where you have physical walls in your geometry, you want to resolve it more finer. And this is what the layer generation does. And without going in too much detail, um, let's, let's just say, okay, what we want to have later is we want to have more fine cells close to all physical walls. And this will be a rack. Um, outlets, right? This is the air outlet, and here we're going to have the cooling supply. So again, air will come in down here, um, the, the cooling, the cool air will be supplied through here. The hot air of the server racks will go, will come out here, and both air flows basically will leave the room through this guy. Yeah? That's, that's sort of the idea. And again, you can see this is too simple because the, the server rack needs to be supplied with air and it's not just generating the air, et cetera. And um, you would, the, the, the placement of the fans and the cooling units, et cetera, everything is kept very, very simple. So this is a simplified case, um, but the general workflow is very, very similar to, to more complex cases. So again, a ton of assumptions here, very simple modeling, but um, sufficient for a, for a first workflow. Okay, and what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the invert selection option, and so I can see that now I selected all physical walls, and I'm going to assign them and say, yes, I want all these walls to be very fine, fine meshed. Yeah, that's, the, that's the idea. And that's about it. I start it, and I'll say, that's great. So my operation runs, you can see in the lower left, my operation is now started in the cloud. It's being right now queued for a machine, and um, once the assignment to the machine has been done, um, this meshing job will be taken care of. And the great thing about this now is that I can simply duplicate this mesh and say, okay, I, I want to run another mesh in parallel, and I'm going to say, uh, I'll do that one moderate, um, and I'm going to kick it off at the same time. No, no heavy lifting is done on your machine, right? And I'm going to see that in a second, this, the next operation will be started down here as well. And so everything run parallel. And I can work on multiple projects in parallel, et cetera. All of this being done with, with cloud power, right? And I guess this mesh operation will take a, um, uh, will take a couple of minutes. Um, but, um, and, and I'm going to use now the, the famous cooking show um, uh, method. And I'm going to say, I prepared something here such that we're not waiting for this mesh generation to be finished. And I'm going to hop over to the dashboard. Um, and we'll use a prepared operation um, that has already essentially finished um, to complete this. I think it should be that guy. So I'm going to jump over to another project where I essentially did the exact same thing I just did, right? I kicked off a mesh operation, and once this operation is done, um, again, this is the data center room one. There we go. 
And you can see, same thing here, right? I have the cooling placed down here. So I have the cooling inlet, the cooling supply is low in the room. The outlet is rather high. And I generated a mesh um, with the exact same settings. You can see it here, cores, four cores. Um, so that's nice, yeah? And here you can see that essentially, um, this room was now meshed, my geometry was meshed, so it was discretized in a lot of small um, finite volume cells, um, which is necessary for the type of analysis we, we're going to run later, right? Um, we're going to use um, a method that is based on the finite volume uh, method, and again, we're having professional trainings and other trainings that introduce you to the finite volume method, but today um, we're, we're rather top level. Okay, I'm going to use that mesh now to run my analysis, um, and that's now the, the fun part, right? So I'm going to hop over from, once my message is generated, I'm going to hop over to the simulation designer, and now it's all about physics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new sim where I'm saying, okay, I'm going to model this um, steady state and, uh, and turbulent. So I'm going to create a new simulation. And with risking that I'm running out of time because we only have 20 minutes left, um, I'll, I'll try to cover that now step by step, that we, that we don't skip just something and something happens out of the blue, that you really see how I set this up, right? Um, okay. One important note here, and let me quickly check on the questions if there's some blockers that popped up. Again, more and more questions coming. Keep them coming. That's great. Um, I, I try to cover them later, um, but I really want to make sure that at least within the 60 minutes, I'll cover the, the complete webinar. Okay, nothing, nothing um, that, is, uh, that, that is a blocker. Okay, so you can see I just created a new simulation, right? And you might notice that the entire user interface is rather clean, right? There is no four or five rows of buttons here at the top where there's a ton of icons and I need to know behind each and every icon what's happening there what do I need to do with this, etc. SimScale is really tr built in a way where we try to make it very, very streamlined so that with every step you make another decision and you're only presented with the relevant information at that point. We call this a template-based approach, right? So the first question SimScale is going to ask you is what do you actually want to do? Um, and this is the analysis type choice. And we see here that there's a ton of different stuff, right? A thermostructural, solid mechanics, all of, all of it within one platform. And what we are interested in today is um, we're going to look at natural convective heat transfer. So this means our, we're going to treat it compressible. So yes, we're interested in a flow, um, in a, in a flow simulation where um, heat is being transferred so where we can look at the temperature uh, field later. But we are not interested in a high temperature, high velocity flow, you know, where you have um, transonic effects and shocks in the flow field and all sorts of stuff, which would, which would be the completely compressible modeling. We are interested in a natural convective heat transfer. And um, without going into the details, this is basically... Um, this is possible, or, or you sh this is, can be applied to all sorts of flows that are weakly compressible, right? So we, where you have um, density changes, but not in a massive manner, um, rather, rather weakly compressible. Okay. The next, uh, the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to model this turbulent, and we're going to use a k epsilon omega, uh, k epsilon turbulence model. Again. Um, you, you, what you would need to do is you would going to look at the velocities you expect in your flow field, and by that you can, um, you can uh, derive the Reynolds number, and based on the Reynolds number, you can say, will this be a laminar flow, will this be a turbulent flow, but we're not going to exercise that today. The second one is um, steady state or transient. So am I interested in transient would mean I'm really computing um, how the flow evolves over time, right? which is um, rather computationally intensive, and we are today only interested in the steady state system, so uh, in the steady state um, of the system. So once the flow has been fully developed, um, basically after an, a, a theoretically unlimited amount of time, what kind of flow field evolves? Okay, and now we're gonna, um, I want to um, draw your attention to the left here, so where you can see analysis type, nothing else. And so, watch what happens once I click Save. So once I click sell, Save, SimScale loads basically a specific template based on my analysis type. And so I now can go basically, um, I, I don't see any structural mechanics stuff here. I don't see any, you know, stuff that is not relevant for me. I just see natural convective heat transfer steady state stuff that, I, that, that is relevant to me. 
and the the um, the approach I'm going to recommend to you is really now going step by step from top to bottom through this. And um, green means um, here a choice has already been made. Um, red means here you need to make a decision, and blue means here you have an optional um, thing to set. And with looking at the time, we really need to speed up. So let's let's get this um, let's get this done. So the first thing is the domain. Which um, what type of domain actually wanna, do I want to use? And so on SimScale, you can run large design studies with a ton of different meshes and a ton of different geometries. So each and every simulation setup can be applied to different meshes in your project. In this case, we're going to use the first one, data center one room mesh, right? The one we just saw a second ago. And in that case, it appears. And under domain, I can see now that different things have been loaded. And one very powerful thing that I want to point out at that point is um, the, the concept of topological entity sets. So in your mesh, you can essentially define or group different faces that are relevant to you. So what you want to do is, for example, I will have later um, this phase where the cooling unit is applied, right? So I, I, I select it, I click on create set, and I can give this set a name. And I've already done so, which I called select inlet, right? Wait, let me show it to you, uh, clear selection. So this is my inlet, right? Excellent. Um, let's check on the outlet. That's my outlet. Um, let's check on the hot inlets. That's those guys, right? Again, modeled as simple inlets where air just appears, which is um, which is basically a simple, a simple modeling, a too simple modeling. Um, and then again, the whole walls where um, where a turbulent boundary layer will appear. Excellent. So that being said, we're done with the domain. The next thing is under domain. Let's make sure we have the gravity modeled. Um, so I'm going to type in minus 0.18. Um, as a gravity materials, um, I'm going to add a flow, a uh, fluid material. Going to hit the add fluid material button. Mm. Ah, there you go. And we have a material, and you can see that you can define any arbitrary type of material. Um, but we have a little library that um, where that covers some of the basic materials, so we're going to import that one. And the important part, and you can see that all, so all sorts of per, uh, material parameters need to be set, and they were automatically set, set for air in that case. And so the only thing I need to cover down here is, since air is still red over here, um, I need to make sure that air is being applied to my domain, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign it, since there's only one region um, available here, I'll assign it here and hit the Save button, and you can see it immediately appears um, appears green. The same would have happened. Um, let's let's deassign it again and um, use the volume selection. So I could go over to volume and say I click on this one and say assign selection from viewer. And there you go. This is only relevant if you have larger assemblies or multi-solid um, or, or multi-part structures that you want to analyze. Here, the whole volume picking um, becomes relevant. Okay. The next thing is, we, you can see we're, um, we're path done with materials. The next thing is initial conditions. And under initial conditions, it basically says um, that we, 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 had a, um, we will use a steady state solver, right? This means we're only interested in the final state, in the, in the steady state of the system. So how does the flow field look after an arbitrary or an, an infinite am amount of time? And the initial conditions basically are the starting point because the solver will go there in an iterative manner. So the, the closer I set my initial conditions to the ultimately um, to the to the velocity field and temperature field I'm expecting, the easier will be the simulation. That's that's the whole deal. Okay. I assume standard pressure in there velocity is something I want to take care of because I gotta supply cooling air down here, right? So, and you can see with the x-axis that I'm going to supply cooling air in negative x-direction. So, what I'm going to say is I'm expecting the whole flow field to rather be um, to rather be oriented towards the negative x-direction. This is why I'm setting an initial um, conditions of minus 0.1 um, meters per second. Temperature, that's fine. Let's start from 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 standard temperature. The rest. 
I did some turbulent calculations before, um, and I'll cover that. We'll cover that in more detail, how to, how to come up with um, good turbulent values um, later. So this is basically the turbulent quantities, the turbulent kinetic energy, and the, and, um, the turbulent dissipation. I'm going to cover that in, in the next workshop in more detail. OK, and now comes the most important part. And afterwards, I'll, I'm going to show you how to start it, and then we're going to do some post-processing, because we're really running out of time, um, in case I have not mentioned it yet. <laughs> OK, um, the boundary conditions essentially will now def decide on um, I'm interested in the in the temperature field in here, in the velocity field, in the density field, et cetera, right? How how does how does that look like inside here? And so what I'm gonna need to supply as an engineer using CFD is how do um how is the boundaries of this, how do the boundaries behave of this domain of this flow field? Because obviously the computer doesn't know that, right? The computer will solve inside of this domain, but it can't know what's happening outside the domain. And this is my work as an engineer to tell the computer, okay, here I'm assuming that, there I'm assuming this. And this is essentially what boundary conditions do. Again, everything that works via a right click works also via a left click. So let's apply the first one where I say cooling inlet. Give this a name. I'm going to model it as a velocity inlet, um, and I'm going to say um, this will be my cooling supply, and I'm going to supply minus 0.25 meters per second. Again, typically you would have some fan boundary condition here, or um, some, um, you know, um, maybe even some mass flow. But in, in that case, I'm going to use a very simple, I'm going to simply um, uh, say the, the velocity and the temperature which is, um, the temperature is set to, what did I say? Oh, yeah. I'm going to supply two, um, I'm going to supply 18 degrees um, Celsius. Um, and again, this is the performance basically of what your cooling unit supplies. You could model it differently, but for the time being, let's stick to this. And here you can see again this great, um, the, the great fact about the topological entity sets. I do not need to use the viewer anymore. I can simply say that's my inlet. I'm going to save it. Let's quickly check, exactly. So here I'm going to supply minus 0.25 meters per second, um, cool air at 18 uh, degrees Celsius. That's, that's the whole deal. And I'm going to do the next thing for the hot air, um, where I say hot inlet. And I'm going to say um, it's the same direction, right? It's those guys here. So it's coming in here, where I'm going to say, um, so this is supplied with um, minus 0 0.5. Mm, come on. So um, and to at uh, at three two eight Kelvin. Um, and we're going to apply it to the hot inlets. Uh, second thing set, let's quickly check. Exactly, there you go. Um, last but not least, I'm going to apply the outlet where I'm going to say, okay, um, air is being sucked out, pressure out, uh, sorry, not sucked out, um, at ambient, at normal pressure. Um, so I'm going to apply a pressure outlet with um, a fixed value. And that's about it. Wait, I forgot to assign the outlet. There you go, outlet. And last but not least, I'm going to assign the walls where I say um, I'm going to model this as walls, no slip, which means um, the air will not, um, will stick to the wall. Wall treatment, that's for the turbulence. Um, we'll cover that next time in more detail. And here it's important, temperature, we're going to say set gradient to zero. So this essentially means that the walls are being treated adiabatic. So heat cannot be, since the, the temperature gradient will be zero across the walls, there is no temperature being, uh, or no heat being transported about these walls, right? Which is, again, an assumption I'm, 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 I'm taking. Okay, and that's basically about it to, to start this. There are some numerics and um, numerical settings where you can tune the solver that I won't go into too much detail currently. Um, and the only thing I want to cover before we do go dive into post-processing is simulation control. So here I'm basically defining the, the overall um, setup of how I want the simulation to be executed. And what I'm going to say is I want to have a thousand iterations uh, being run um, with a write control of only the last step. Again, remember, um, remember that 
we are running a steady state analysis, right? So this means we're only interested in the final step. So when I'm running a thousand iterations of this solver, I'm, I'm only interested in the last one. For debug debugging purposes from time to time, it, it makes sense to write out more time steps for the, for the time being, that's fine. Since one question was already, um, was already asked is that one question, how many cores to use? And that's sort of between art and science, but for simulation, I can see now that my mesh has 800,000 cells, right, that I can find here on the mesh. And a rule of thumb that I typically use is that 50,000 um, cells per core is sort of the lower limit. You should not go below that. So even eight cores could be fine as well, but it would be overkill to say, um, now, I, I want to have 5,000 cells per, um, per, per core. That would be simply overkill, right? That's sort of uh, roundabout. Okay, um, last but not least, no, don't save it. Um, I'm going to run it. I'm going to check the simulation. Check was fine. I'm going to run it and say that's data center one. Oh, come on. And we're good to go. And that was everything, right? Um, being honest, a bit too fast. So um, in the in the tutorial, and this is why we're having the homework assignments, right? The homework assignment leads you step by step in much detail through this. Um, the entire project here will be published later as well, so you can review the exact settings, um, etc. So I just want to give you a feeling for the, the for the engineering decisions you need to make during such a simulation setup. This was this was the important part, right? And as our meshing operations um, were started in the cloud, we can see now that the simulation here um, runs as well in the cloud. And that's that's the whole idea, right? And so, again, let's use the cooking show um, phrase. And I've prepared a completed setup. And for this, I'll quickly jump over. I think it's, it should be that one. And here I have completed runs because I, I want to make sure that I give you a feeling for the post-processing as well. And then we've seen really um, a complete walkthrough to, as to how SimScale can be used to analyze a cooling flow. In the meantime, I check on some urgent uh, question, but it seems to be fine. Okay. Let's jump over to the post-processor. Again, you can see that this is, this, this is the almost the exact setup I chose, right? We'll publish this one here later so that you can review it. But essentially what happens is that it took 41 minutes. I can check on the residual convergence. I can check on um, if my uh, solution has already reached steady state. What you typically want to have is um, you want to have four to five orders of magnitudes and residual drop um, here, but um, it looks good. So let's jump over and let's check on one of the designs. Um, and again, this is the third tab that I want to make sure that we've covered in the last minutes of this webinar, which is the post-processor, which essentially means that whatever you analyzed on SimSkill, the simulation you ran on SimSkill, can now be post-processed completely online. So this means um, that the data set that was generated is now being loaded within a cloud environment, and you can now basically interact with the, with the solution fields here. And let's fire up. So this is the data sender one, right? Um, and here I can see that cooling, let's first check on the velocity. Um, I'll switch over to the velocity. So this is the velocity field. And I can see that I'm, I'm pressing um, air into, into the system here, right? like this. I'm pressing hot air into the system like this. And naturally, we would expect the hot air to rise immediately um, due to the um, temperature, to the higher temperature, and which it does. And we can now rescale this a little bit to get a better feeling um, for, um, for the velocities, maybe to um, 0.5. And we can see now, right, a first hint that we see is, okay, we would expect this because we, we opposed it as a boundary condition, but a first hint are these dead zones behind here, right? So we can see that behind um, the, the first one, so with having the cooling inlet being placed very low, we're having um, a very constant low velocity region over here. 
and which might be disadvantageous because it might heat up simply, right? But the average air age uh, might simply go up. And so we can validate this by switching over to the um, to the temperature field. And again, this we can see this, right? So the stuff gets hot over here. Um, and, and we can now sort of hint this or use this hint and say it might be a good idea to, to place the cooling rather up. And this is exactly what we did. So in a second run, what we did is instead of having the cooling inlet down here, we placed it up here. And again, keep in mind, that's a, um, a simplified geometry, right? In, in real world, you might be placing your cooling unit somewhere completely different. You would have a complex, more complex modeling, but essentially you're, it's a what-if scenario, right? What if I change um, my coolant unit, unit uh, placement? And um, the, the simulation of this was done exactly the same way. Um, you analyze that design exactly the same way. And um, with this, we're being almost there at the end of this um, presentation because I don't do, do this. Uh, I don't do this now live to post-processing, but I've prepared some post-processing. Um, what we did, what we did is essentially a design one with having the cooling placed rather low, a design two having the coolant um, inlet placed rather high, and just checking on what what is the um, what if yeah, what happens if I if I cho choose this placement for the cooling. And what happens um, is now this is a little bit of prepared post-processing. So here. The upper side here is again the um, the uh, the design one with the low um, cooling placement, cooling inlet, and the lower part is the cooling placement rather up, right? And what you can see immediately is that placing, and I'm here on the right on the slides. I hope you can see this. Um, I hope you can see this quite good. Um, here on the right, you can see that we sort of um, introduced more movement over here. And um, it makes sense, right? We have the hot temperature, uh, the hot air up here. So we want to have the cooling, um, cool air supplied immediately here. We're going to introduce more movement over here. And what happens is that the, um, the velocity field changes. And interestingly enough, if we now look at the um, resulting temperature, the average room temperature in the um, design case one was um, was almost to, or a little bit more than two degrees Celsius higher, right? So just by by changing where I supply my cooling unit, uh, where I supply my cool air, um, can help you to sort of get with the same with the same cooling if, um, with the same cooling cool air supplied with the same energy being used, you reduce the um, the temperature, the average temperature in the room. And we can see this here overall. You can see the color coding. It ind indicates it here. We can see that here the lower temperature, the temperature is lower, um, which um, gives you an edge, right? Which, which obviously was a very simple experiment, a very simple design change, and we can immediately validate the effects. That's the whole idea. Um, and with that being said, two minutes <laughs> over time, I'm, I'm closing the official part of the, of the webinar with a hint to uh, the do-it-yourself assignment. Um, as discussed in the beginning of this webinar, we really believe in hands-on um, workshops, hands-on webinars. SimScale provides this tremendous opportunity that everything happens online, right? You do not need to install any, anything. You do not need any specific hardware. And um, everything you needed to watch this, this webinar is sufficient to, to run a simulation yourself. And what I would highly recommend you to do is visit our forum. So this is at um, simskill.com slash forum, or if you have an account, you should see it as well in the top right. And in the forum, what we publish is a session one air conditioning simulation of an airspace. And here we supplied a step-by-step -step, um, process of how to analyze um, an HVAC application, so an air conditioning application of an, um, of an office space. So a little bit of a different analysis. The analysis type is very similar. Um, so the analysis you're asked to do is very similar, but the application is a different one, right? So step-by-step, -step, it leads you through the whole setup. Um, the geometry is being supplied, the post-processing is being supplied, and you can do all of this completely for free. And um, this is really from, I, I would highly recommend you doing it. If you want to get the most out of this workshop, out of this, out of this one hour, um, then, um, then do this, do this assignment. Um, and we do this in the forum because you have the option to down here, post questions, 
connect with other workshop attendees, connect with other um, SimScale engineers um, that, are, that are happy to help you. Um, and with that being said, that was um, I'm, I'm, the Q and A will come in a, in a second. So I'm going to spend more time on the Q and A, and um, for the ones that that have more time and that can stick around for some more minutes. But the um, the official part of the webinar is over, and we're going to see each other next week. Um, the next session will be um, hosted by my colleague Babak. He's our head of CFD here at SimScale, and there um, he's going to uh, walk you through an analysis of contamination or a contamination control analysis within a parking lot I can highly recommend as well. Um, similar application domain, similar workflow, um, and again, basically giving you the first experiences with SimScale to, to, being, um, to, to learn what's necessary to apply to your own projects. All right, and now to the questions. Um, so, um, so one user or one workshop attendee asked for um, how can we get the software package? You go to simscale.com um, uh, and you want to go to create free account and that's all you need. So you create your free account over here, um, you, you need to confirm your email address and then you're in there. So it's really, it's completely web-based, um, it runs entirely in your, in your browser. So there's nothing else to it. Um, what another workshop attendee asked, um, can I use this lesson for simulation cooling a computer as well? Um, I assume it's, the, the question is rather, um, is it this or does the same lesson apply to or, or the same analysis apply to electronics cooling or, or the cooling of maybe a computer or, or a server rack inside? Um, let me think about it. Essentially, yes, it always depends on how you want to model it, right? Um, if you want to model, if you want to simulate the heat transfer within your heat sinks as well, so you want to account for a non-homogeneous heat transfer coefficient um, across your, your um, electronics cooling equipment, then you would rather go for a CHT analysis, so for a conjugate heat transfer analysis. But if you're interested, if you're saying, I'm going to assume a um, uh, constant um, heat transfer from the specific electronics uh, equipments, then yes, then that would be a similar application. Then again, do you want to model a transient or steady state? So definitely these coolings um, analysis all are um, low temperature, low velocity, right? So the, the way they are analyzed, the way turbulence works in, in them, are all, all of them are very similar. So this is also why we're going to host more workshops on this because um, we have a ton of users doing this as well and they, they are using similar analysis types, yeah. So I guess the crisp answer is yes. Um, One user asked, um, how does SimScale treat the data security on SimScale? For example, I just uploaded a 3D model of a machine. It's not become a public model, right? Um, yes, so what you are completely in control over um, whether or not, uh, crap, that was the wrong browser. Let me switch over. You are completely in control over whether you want to publish um, uh, a project of yours or not. So whenever you upload a, a model in, so once you create a new project, you can either decide to make it public or not. So make it public or private. The differentiation, and that's the important part, um, only paid customers, so only our premium plans are allowed to create public projects, eh, are allowed to create private projects. So this means that all of these projects with a lock up here, the ones that I created with the, with the button or to the right, with a slider to the right, are only visible to me. Nobody else can see them, and only I can see them. But I can create a public project by saying, okay, it's public. So this is the, this is the decisive point if, uh, if your, your project will be publicly accessible or not. And also within the workbench, within um, the application, you can see it also in the top left because this lock is everywhere in private projects. So you can check on this as well. 
Um, okay. I'm trying to because uh, just as a heads up, there are way too many questions to be covered in the in the time left. So I'm trying to pick out some of the um, the ones that I can answer in the time left because some of them also would really need to um, where well, we really would need to have a, a longer discussion about what exactly you want to model. Um, Ah, yeah. There's one question. Is there any limitation on what kind of drawing can be uploaded? Um, for example, 2D, 3D. Very good question. Um, currently, the default sim scale simulation setup works completely in 3D. So, whatever you want to upload, you want to upload um, a 3D model of whatever you're analyzing. There are, without going too much into detail, there is a possibility to sort of analyze, run a 2D flow analysis of what, you, what we just saw without, um, so, uh, while uploading a 3D CAT model. So yes, it's possible to run 2D analysis on SimScale, but with limitations. So the crisp answer is, right now on Sim, SimScale is being meant for analyzing 3D problems. So that's what I what what I would recommend doing right now. Um, there's another question: um, Why should I use four cores if 31 are possible? I I, tr I tried to cover that during the simulation setup um, in a uh, very briefly, but I think it I, I maybe I, I think it was um, too short. So let me let me give a little bit of an example here as well. Ah, and by the way, I think we have a nice video on that as well. Let me quickly check. So there's one um, one video that says supercomputing power um, with SimScale in, in our tutorial section, and this is this explains exactly that, because the one might think that always using more cores to getting a job done, let it be simulation or let it be a meshing job, is always better, but the reality it's not, um, the, because the um, the time it takes to run your job on more cores does not scale linearly with the more cores you're adding. Because the more cores you're adding, you need to distribute the problem you're solving to more cores, right, to across across many different cores. And these cores need to talk to each other, need to communicate with each other. And so this, this um, more cores are only better if the communication overhead that is being added is reasonably low. So this means the bigger the problem, the more cores um, is better. And so the, the roundabout number or the, the rule of thumb is anything above 50,000 cells per core makes sense to use more cores. So to, to give you a hands-on example, I have a 32, um, I have this mesh that we generated together, right, where we have 800,000 cores, uh, 800,000 cells. And so if I use an eight core machine, I have 100,000 cells per core. Which would be completely fine. You would you would get a good good performance here as well. With 16 cores, I would go down to 50,000 uh, cells per core, which is still reasonable. Which is my rule of thumb, right? That's still fine. And now, 32,000 cores. Uh, th sorry, 32 cores, which would would mean I have 25,000 cells per core, and this is goes below my rule of thumb. And here, the communication overhead might be already too high to give you a real speed up. And so this is my rule of thumb that I oftentimes use. But it, then again, it's problem dependent. Um, it's depending on if you're running steady state versus transient. It's de it depends on a lot of things, but that's sort of the rule of thumb. What we often see is once an engineer um, uses SimScale more and more, he sort of finds his sweet spot himself as to which cores make the most sense for his type of problem. OK. Um, Ah, oh, yeah. There's one good question. Um, one uh, workshop attendee asks, what about the velocity values for the walls, um, heat losses or gain from the walls? That's a very good question. So I didn't dive too much into, into details regarding the boundary conditions, right? I, I showed you I applied a, a velocity inlet for the cooling. I applied a hot inlet for the hot air as well. I applied um, an outlet and a wall, but I didn't go into detail here. Um, so let's let's have a quick look here as well. Um, so because he, he asks a good question, what if I want to model the wall differently, et cetera, right? 
essentially, um, what I showed you is just boundary condition types, right? And these boundary condition types, for example, the velocity inlet, um, what I can see here is that I need to define velocity and temperature, and we, we, we did so, right? We defined um, the, ve the velocity um, that, that's coming in, we defined the temp temperature that's coming in. But what we did not define, what happened in the background is what type of pressure is being applied here, what type of physical quantities is being applied here, the dynamic viscosity and all that sort of stuff. Because SimScale chooses intelligently, basically, for a velocity inlet, the default values for the other physical quantities you want to define on your boundary conditions. So this means, in fact, a pressure, a pressure boundary condition was applied here, but it was done in the background because you want to you want to choose a zero gradient for the pressure um, if you want to have a, if you have a fixed value velocity. So that's sort of it's intelligent choices made by SimScale. But if you want to have complete control over what you're doing in a specific boundary condition, you can go to custom and define all the physical quantities yourself on one face. So this means the, the boundary condition types I chose, for example, the wall, it sort of gives you, um, it says, what about the velocity? We're saying no slip, and no slip immediately means zero, zero, zero for the velocity on all of these walls. Temperature set to set set to uh, set gradient to zero immediately immediately gives you a set gradient to zero across all walls, right? And we didn't talk about turbulent quantities here. We didn't talk about the pressure, etc., because this is a packaged boundary condition, a pre-packaged boundary condition that is very common and very often being used. Um, and if you want to, if you're an advanced user or you want to have more control, you can at any point in time go to custom and really dive into the very details about what you want to do here, right? This is sort of how boundary condition um, setup at SimScale works. Um, ha, very good question um, from another workshop user. Could we use the symmetry in the problem to reduce uh, processing time? Absolutely. Yeah. Let me quickly think, is the problem, yeah, the problem is um, is um, definitely symmetric. So what you would want to do is, over an on shape, you would simply cut the geometry. So you would do it in your CAD modeling environment. So you would cut, you would only import half of the, of the data center room um, and supply and add one additional boundary condition that says symmetry. Good, good catch. Yeah, that would be possible. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah, one user asks a, um, um, a formal question. How do we register for next week's webinar? Um, good news, you are already registered for next week's webinar. So this means once signed up for this workshop, you'll automatically receive the reminder emails 24 hours before. You will receive the recordings, emails, etc. So, so you're, you're fine on that end. Oh, um, mm, my internet connection broke uh, for one minute. What is meant for topological by topological assignments? Does it mean telling the computer which is wall, which is cooling inlet, etc.? I I cover that just because it's so important. Um, yes, topological mapping means whatever I defined up here, right? What let's let's use an easy one. So okay, I'm saying there is some velocity inlet. So where air is coming in at a specific temperature with a specific velocity, but where is that now being applied? And so the one the one way I could have done this is by saying um, I, I switch over and say okay it's at this phase, and I'll say assign selection from viewer and I could do it phase wise right so that would work as well. Let's clear this. Um, but the great thing about the phase sets is that I, that I have already pre-packaged um, my phase selections and I use them here. So this is what's being meant with topological assignments and it's always the same thing. You, you add a boundary condition, you choose the type, and then you say where it's being applied. And that's the whole, the whole magic behind the entire boundary condition definition. Um, moving on. Um, just because it's a fast question and, um, and, and a quick one and an important one, it's being asked quite often. Um, so some people missed the webinar or parts of the webinar. Yes, we have recorded it. Um, it, is, it is being recorded while I speak. And we will put it to YouTube um, on YouTube um, as, as fast as possible, um, the latest by tomorrow. And you're going to receive an email with hinting you to the 
um, to the uh, hinting you to the video as well as the homework. Um, one of the parameters required to calculate the Reynolds number, will that be explained in detail in the next session? Um, so the Reynolds number is rather simple, so I guess we'll cover it in the next uh, session, but there's also resources in the SimScale documentation, et cetera, how to, how to define the Reynolds number, so that's, um, that's an easy one. So I guess, yes, you will find, either you'll find it in the workshop or you will find it in the forum and the documentation. Um, So somebody um, makes a good point. I'm not sure if it's a suggestion or a question, but um, this user says some suggestions about meshing sizes for HVAC, taking or keeping in mind that the problem has high scale, so size of the room um, as to the, to the low chairs or the small chairs. Um, I, I think it's, it refers to... Oh, <laughs> okay, one user already analyzed uh, did the homework. That's, that's good news. Um, I think he refers to the fine granular um, uh, model here, right? So in the homework. So we can see that there's very fine chairs and, and, um, and, uh, and tables, et cetera. And then there's a, a rather a big room. And he definitely has a point that whenever you have, whenever you have details in your geometry, um, that will affect what type of mesh you're going to need to actually uh, resolve these details um, appropriately. So always, whenever you start thinking about preparing a CAD model for a simulation, you should think about, okay, what are, what are the important aspects of this CAD model? What are the driving design parameters that I want to analyze? And so you could actually think of, we have, we have customers analyzing um, HVAC systems for offices that completely leave away all furniture that say, okay, that we, we're gonna, um, that's, that's too detailed and it's, it's not necessary and you, do, you never know how the customer does that. So it would be completely fine to remove it here and analyze it that as well. But he's completely right that once you have detailed geometry in, your, um, in, your, in the overall geometry, it might have implication on meshing. And, um, to jumping over to meshing, SimScale gives you different options to capture these fine granular uh, things you, you do see um, in, your, in your geometry. So that guy, um, we, we did see that this was highly automatic, the, the way how we generated the mesh, right? But there is another option to say, um, I want to create, um, I want to have more control over the, um, over the meshing process, where I'm going to say, I'm going to use a hex dominant, dominant complete parametric uh, mesh analysis. And this guy has local refinements where I can say, oh, I want to resolve my chairs finer, um, I want to add a, a region of interest into this, um, et cetera. So SimScale provides you with the possibility to control how the mesh is being generated. So that's, that's available, but it's probably too much for a 60 minutes, <laughs> 60 minutes webinar, but, but good point, definitely. Um, moving on. Uh, one uh, user asks, can I use AutoCAD 3D to upload um, a model? So I'm not a, um, I'm not a, uh, I don't have a lot of seat time in AutoCAD, but I'm, I'm very positive, I'm very confident that um, it, it exports step models as well and that you can upload to SimScale. So SimScale currently provides support for the generic exchange formats step and iGIS and we rarely saw a 3D CAD model that does not export it. So um, uh, basically the fallback is always export a step and upload it to SimScale, so that should be possible. Huh. Could you upload, one user asked, could you upload the tutorial as a PDF file so we can print it? Hmm. Promise, I'll check on it. I'm not sure if you can print from the forum. Um, let me, I'll definitely check on it. Um, also with our, with our um, uh, user success team, um, let me check on that. I'll, I'll promise I'll check on it. Building. Um, so one workshop attendee asks, would it be possible to simulate wind-driven ventilation strategies in a building? Um, so 
let's just try to uh, make, make a, give, give a crisp answer. Um, <laughs> so in general, the um, in general, it always depends on your way of modeling. Um, so SimScale is a general modeler, right? So here we did see that we actually just modeled the. Um, let, let's use this as an example, even though it's probably a bad example for a, for a wind-driven uh, ventilation strategy of, of something. But let's assume um, we would now have because we sort of constrained or we sort of prescribed how the cooling strategy was done by a boundary conditions, right? What I could do is simply extend the domain to say, okay, I'm going to now analyze the entire how this domain is being uh, treated. So the wind is coming from externally and, and going in here through some ducting maybe and then going into this. So yes, it always depends on how you model the um, the your domain and what type of uh, things you, or what type of assumptions or where you're cutting the problem, right? Because even this data center is being part of some sort of cooling unit, right? We could even in this data center say, okay, we want to model the cooling unit as well. So it always de depends on where you set the the, um, the interfaces or the, or the boundaries of your problem. So I think the general answer to this is yet, yes, but we all know um, as engineers, we know that it depends on the problem, right? So probably would need to take a look at, but um, what I can definitely um, also hint you to is that there's also a ton of um, external wind analysis being done on SimScale. So if you check on the public projects, and for example, I think it's called Singapore. Uh, Singapore, I think it's poor. So so anyway, so there's um, there's external analysis being done um, on SimScale as well, where wind analysis of, of buildings has been done and to simulate the ventilation strategy b built on external wind, that should be possible. Yeah, I'm searching for that one here. Let's see. Okay, in the meantime, let's go to the next question. Ah, yeah, there you go, right? So this is an analysis of, of Singapore, the so external air, so there's also a ton of uh, analysis external being done as well. Anyways. Um, One uh, workshop attendee asks if you can run direct numerical simulation with SimScale, so DNS. Um, no, as of now, this feature is not available um, right now on SimScale. Uh, another uh, question from a user, also a good one. Um, what about FSI computations with SimScale? FSI, fluid structure interactions. So essentially, um, you have a flow that you're solving for and this flow interacts with a structure so with a solid part and um, you want to know how the um, the pressure of the fluid so how the force that is being generated through the fluid onto the um, structure bends the structure or, or interacts with the structure and no um, this feature is right now not available on the production system but stay tuned here um, there will there will be good things coming uh, soon Um, and I think the last question, um, there, there's because there's um, a ton of more, and I'm, I'm sorry that we cannot cover all of them, but um, I promise again via the forum, via my direct email, there's a ton of options how you can uh, how you can get these questions answered. So um, this, it doesn't mean that if we don't answer them here, that they've never um, that they are never answered. Um, are pre-made thermal loads available for HVAC modeling? Very good. Very good one. That's a highly requested feature, and we are um, we are uh, working towards this right now. SimScale is still a rather general modeler, uh, a general um, uh, simulation environment. So there, um, we are working on more and more HVAC specific um, simulation aspects you want to have. But so far, the focus was really to provide really the core, the basic functionality that you can use to model most of what you want to have in HVAC. But pre-packaging them has has just started, right? So we're we're working towards this, um, and there will be more models, more. Um, more loads, also more objects, etc., coming down the road. But as of now, um, this is a this is a limitation on the production system. Yep. All right. Um, 
With that being said, I think um, we covered quite a few questions. Again, we have a second um, session coming up next week, right? So um, uh, stay with uh, there. There might be more questions there. Also, I am pretty sure that a lot of the questions that I have not answered will be answered while you're doing the homework. And um, the next step is now you're going to receive an email with the re recording of the webinar as well as a link to the homework. And then um, I'm going to see you, uh, or my colleague Babak will see you um, next Tuesday, same time, same place. Thank you very much uh, for attending the session today. Um, have a great day and take care.